question. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, scalable and reproducible bioinformatics workflows using Nextflow and NFCore. My background is from genomics, so I'm, I'm a population geneticist, bioinformatician by training, so I'm not a proteomics person. However, these concepts scale very well to other fields. So we have people from physics, chemistry, also using the framework and the pipeline uh, uh, framework community behind it. So I think that scales very well to other fields as well. So as you might already know, data and computational biology in general is going to be, or is already quite big, sometimes terabytes, sometimes even petabyte scale, depending on the projects that you're dealing with. In many cases, it's very diverse data. So we have data from very different technology platforms that needs to be integrated in, in order to get some biological insights. We typically also have the problem that whatever we measure might contain errors, no matter which technology we're using, all these method methodologies do pr produce errors. Some of them are more obvious than others, but in many cases we do see errors and we have to have models and tools and workflows that can cope with these errors, that can deal with these errors, that can also be kind of robust towards producing some output, even given that there are some errors to a certain extent. So to summarize that a bit here, we need methods and tools to analyze such data, no matter which technology we produce them from. So one challenge I've seen mostly, and I think most people can agree here, if they work with bioinformatics tools and bioinformatics software, we do see a challenge in terms of software dependencies. So whatever you do, you typically build on top of somebody else's work already, either by using some software libraries, by using some fancy C++ framework, some library in Python or something like that. And most of the workflows that we see today consists of multiple of these tools. So we don't have just one tool. We typically have like dozens of tools, sometimes hundreds of tools in a single workflow, in a single pipeline um, that we use to do some analysis. The problem with this is we get very complex dependency trees and configuration requirements for these dependencies also tend to be very, very um, complex in the end. Yeah, of course. Why is it hanging now? So when you look at this, this is a web server for the annotation of a parasite genome that was published in NAR in 2016. So if you look at this, each node re represents a single step in that workflow, in that annotation workflow. That's just a very good example because that, that's one of the few papers that also published this along the actual paper. So uh, it was easy to find in this case. So what you see here is nodes with the tool that is used and then connections between nodes that are relying on each other. So if you see that as a bioinformatician, what typically happens is you get a face like that. You just end up being like, what? Okay, I don't understand half of it. And typically you need hours to do that. And especially if the code is not written very well, you end up digging into that code for hours and hours and won't really see that much. Another problem we see today is the challenge of reproducibility. So we already heard in some aspects about reproducibility. So some of the uh, projects today are much more large scale than they've been in the last 10, 15, 20 years. So in the genomics world, which I'm more familiar with, we have the 1000 Genomes Project. Uh, we have the 100,000 Genomes Project in the UK and other projects as well coming up that are sequencing up to 1 million genomes, human genomes in this case but also other projects are coming more uh, up to speed, producing larger quantities of data with more technology platforms than ever before. And the problem with this is this, these are typically long running projects. So we're not talking about this is a project, we're doing an experiment, we're doing maybe 10 experiments and then we just have the data, we analyze everything with one pipeline and that's it. What we typically see there is that we have data and the next three PhD student generations will also generate some data. We need to be able to reproduce what we did on the first batch of data with the same efficiency and reproducibility that we have to do with the last batch of data. So that's the ideal case that we would like to achieve here. And the problem with this is, as you've been all aware, I guess, and we already heard about it at some point uh, during this meeting here, that many paper results are really hard to reproduce. It's really tough if you have to download data from somebody. Sometimes people are 
not giving you food, full details, what kind of parameters they use. They are not giving you full disclosure on what kind of tool they used. It's very different and there is no standard for doing this. Uh, so you should actually, so that's the idea behind why I have this on my slides here. You should actually have this for all of the publications today. So ideally, in an ideal setting, everybody publishes data together with the parameter software and the workflows analysis tools that they used, at least in a way that people can really reproduce what, what they've been doing. That would be like the nicest way to do it, but that's not the reality, unfortunately, in many cases. So that's what you typically see. This is something I saw on Giga Science on the Twitter page they had. Um, you see this fancy new method out there. You come there, ah, oh, yeah, we have cool data. We want to analyze that. That seems like a perfect fit. And then you end up having a lot of trouble with it. Like, ah, oh, this just runs on a certain operating system. This just runs with a certain language that I'm not familiar with, so I can't even adjust it to my needs. Only a certain version runs on my operating system, on my computer. We have issues with file formats, readability. There's like tons of hidden caveats in here that you might not see when you first see the method out in a fancy paper or a fancy journal. And then you end up like, why? Why should I actually do that? Yeah. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce Nextflow. Nextflow is a fully automatable, paralyzable, reliable, very reliable, to be honest. So I've, I've been working in a core unit. We've been doing analyses for lots of different projects from different types of data with different types of workflows and it proved to be very reliable. It's very easy to run. So we had people with a biology background without computational background who were able to run the workflows that have been written by bioinformaticians like me. And it gives you extremely well reproducible results. So in the end, you have your workflow. You share that on GitHub, you versionize it there, you provide that to others and people can just use it, reuse it wherever they want and whenever they want. The good thing with this is it's a custom domain specific language. It's a fast prototyping language, so it's really easy to learn. You don't have to learn like a completely new programming language. At first it might look like one, but it's actually a, a defined subset of Java slash Groovy. So if you, for example, have some Java knowledge at some point, or you even know some C++, it might feel, feel very familiar very soon. So you might not end up having a, a huge learning curve. That might be tricky. It's enabling task composition. So if you have multiple tools that you want to stitch together, it's like super straightforward to do that. We have easy parallelization. So if you have large scale data that you want to process, you can even use internal methods in the, uh, in the Nextflow framework that allow you to easily parallelize that and make it even more efficient and faster, which is nice because that typically is something very time consuming if you do that with let's say Python or C++. It's self-contained, which is a really cool feature as well. So you can have your dependencies, your tools that you want to use with Nextflow inside containers, which is nowadays considered kind of a best practice because it gives you the possibility to store that container somewhere in a container registry and pull it whenever you need it for some future follow-up analysis. So you can store whatever software develop dependencies you have in such a container, in multiple containers even, keep them, store them in your locker and if you come back five years later you just pull them from the registry you have a backup of these containers hopefully then you can just rerun the analysis as if it were as if it were today the, the isolation of these dependencies is also very nice because you're less prone to have problems with your computing system you keep the container you rerun everything if you want to at some point without having to think about the infrastructure that you're running on. Even if your cluster dies, you set up Docker, you set up Singularity with your IT sysadmin on your HPC system, for example, and then you can rerun the same analysis as if there were no changes, which is nice. And it really works. So that's really a no brainer functionality. You know? So Nextflow script looks like this, for example, that's a very simple one. You've already seen one in the OpenMS uh, introduction in the beginning. So you have your input and that is uh, Nextflow works with so-called channels. So you channel data between individual processes. You have your process fastqc that takes a file reads from the input channel that I've defined over here. You have your output file which is a fastqc.zip.html, which you pipe into another channel called results. 
And then you have your script section that just executes a tool fastqc minus q on this reads file. So that's a very simple one. Of course, you can do a lot more logic there. You can make that arbitrarily complex if you want to, but this is like a very basic one. And this kind of script can be run using nextflow, nextflow run main and f minus minus reads fastq.gzap and will run fastqc on all the data that you just provided with this wildcard. So that's a very easy thing. The cool thing about that is this is running, if you configure it properly, in a Docker container, in a Singularity container, using Bioconda or Conda Forge um, packages without you having to load modules, do fancy stuff to get that up and running. That's transparent. It behaves the same way whether you do that with Docker, Singularity, Conda, or whether you don't do it with it. You don't see a difference in terms of the usage for yourself, which makes it really easy and beginner friendly. The cool thing about this entire concept of Nextflow is also that you have a so-called executor abstraction. So you write your script typically on your note notebook or your whatever you have, like workstation or something like that. And you use an executor called local. So you execute each of the tasks, each of the processes on your local machine. You develop it there, you do some testing, you do some benchmarking, whatever you want. And then after a while, uh, yeah, you have some real world, let's say bigger data that you want to anal analyze. So for example, like let's say a couple of hundred gigabytes that you might not want to analyze on your local network. So you go to your cluster scheduler. So the only thing that you have to adjust here on the, on the workflow level is the executor. So the only thing you do, you select the profile and you set the executor, for example, to PBS and then you use the PBS scheduler can do the same with a Kubernetes cluster if you want to. You can do the same if you are, for example, not having access to local infrastructure and you just rent access like uh, Amazon AWS batch, for example. Then you just use process.executor AWS batch. Uh, Nextflow will submit these jobs given your access tokens are set and that kind of stuff. Um, we'll submit these jobs to AWS batch. So you'll run on the cloud without changing your workflow. So the workflow will be the same, the only thing you change is basically where to submit the jobs to. That's the cool thing about that. So with this in mind, as we've seen, okay, this works really well and it's uh, really nice and uh, people can reuse the same workflow across different infrastructures very easily without having to adjust a lot. We figured as we've been working in a core unit, um, okay, maybe we should have this one level higher up in terms of building a community around this. And that is basically how NF Core was born. So I met uh, Phil in Barcelona like three years ago, together with another person from Singapore, back then Singapore, he's now working for Microsoft. And we came up with the idea, okay, how could we actually get this going across institutions? So it doesn't make sense to have people from Stockholm, for example, developing the same kind of workflow for the same type of data, for example, uh, if we do basically the same thing in the workflow, just with some tiny parameter adjustments. So the idea was that we just build a community around these pipelines, generic pipelines in this case, to collect production ready pipelines for bioinformatics cores, core units. The idea, idea behind that is if we can invest the time that we typically invest in developing our own workflows together in bigger workflows that can accommodate more people, then we can save time in development quite a lot, to be honest. Also, that allows us to involve, to do much more testing of these workflows because we can test them in edge cases. We can test them on various types of data because people also produce different types of data and figure out, okay, what's best for the type of data that I'm working with, for example. And what we also could be doing then is uh, investing that time in more updates of these workflows because I'm not alone anymore. I have people across multiple institutions who have multiple different time schedules. For example, we have people in Singapore, we have people in the US, we have people in Europe. So even if you do a pull request review on, on GitHub, for example, you might have somebody doing that while you are even asleep. So that's actually quite nice. So together with this bunch of people then, we founded NF Core. So the website is here on NF Core. And there's now about 60, 70 people actively contributing pipelines or expertise to these pipelines in the meantime. So we spread across the globe nowadays. So you see that already. 
and others are joining. Sometimes we have people who are not actively contributing in the beginning, but start to use pipelines and then gradually start also contributing code to existing pipelines or even adding new pipelines with different backgrounds. All these pipelines are tailored to requirements. So what we kind of enforce there is to make it easier for everybody to contribute. We enforce a couple of, a set of best practices. So one is obviously since it's NF core, Nextflow core, it's Nextflow based. All of the pipelines are MIT based uh, licensed so that they can even be used in commercial settings, which sometimes makes it easier to work with companies. Uh, we require that the software that is used in the pipelines is bundled in Docker slash Singularity. We require that pipelines are tested in with continuous integration. So whenever somebody changes something on the code level, then this is automatically tested with GitHub Actions. We require stable release tax on when somebody is actually making a pipeline run at some point and that works and it's been tested. We require that there is a release on GitHub so that people can refer to that specific release. Okay, I used version 1.1.0 of that pipeline. I want to reuse that in two years from now on as well and that will be still there. That's what we require. And the pipeline usage structures kind of, we have a template for that so that people can use, which makes it easier for onboarding new users, but also easier for people reviewing your code if you contribute something. So the cool thing with this is if you have templates set up, if you follow these community guidelines, you get a couple of things for free. So for example, testing. Testing of pipelines is typically something you should be doing no matter which type of data you analyze, you should always have tests. And ideally you should have tests for the data, tests for the pipeline before you actually have a working pipeline. That's the ideal case because that will always have the benefit that you don't run into certain edge cases where you don't even know what you're doing, where you develop something that does produce something but not the meaningful result that you're actually looking for. So the idea here is what we do here, for example, is so the two columns up there. So the next flow run, Travis built there, profile test comma Docker. That is actually fetching some test data that we have publicly available on GitHub and runs this test on Travis CI. It's now replaced by a GitHub Actions, but the concept is itself didn't change. So it's the same thing basically. It's just a different testing service now. So and that runs for a while. And then in the end, hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, you end up having a nice little page that tells you all tests passed, whatever you changed on the code level, whatever you changed on the documentation level didn't break already existing working code, which is what you would like to see. All of the NF core pipelines come with interactive reports and documentation, so HTML reports. Typically we use a tool called MultiQC, which was developed by Phil Ewells, the other guy I showed before. Um, it's uh, interactive, you can't see that here, but it's interactive HTML reports that you get for each pipeline that you execute that can be arbitrarily um, amended to incorporate analyses from various types of tools. So you can have stats tables in there, you could have plots in there that are interactive then we're using some Python libraries. So these are typically zoomable, exportable, you can uh, create SVG graphics out of this, for example. So it's a really cool tool can be adjusted very easily to fit whatever data you have in your analyses. And then you also have nice little um, interactive reports, which prove to be very helpful if you work, for example, in such a bioinformatics core unit, because that's what a lot of the customers, they want to see in the end. They don't want just a pure, let's say, a text file with some data. In many cases, they also want to get some overview of the data, let's say. So, since this is tended to be a bit overwhelming for new people in NF Core, what we did, we created a couple of tools, so-called NF Core tools, that can help you onboarding and using these best practices, the community behind it. So there is, for example, a tool called NF Core Create that helps you creating a new pipeline from scratch. So I just want to show you quickly how that looks like. So what I do there is I activate a conda environment. And then I do NF core create. I want to create a new pipeline now from scratch without any code before. So I call that a name. I give it a small description. Um, yeah, that's like just logem ipsum basically, nothing really meaningful there. 
And then that pipeline is created automatically for me. So if you go there, you basically see there, it's creating an entire structure of data. So there's assets directory, a bin directory, change log, code of conduct, conf files, Docker files, environment YAML, a main NF and an XFlow config. So this is already a running workflow that is called the same way you just gave it, following the best practices that we use in NF core. So it's really a no brainer. If you install that small little Python helper utility, you can get up a running workflow within a couple of minutes. And that follows best practices, already has tests included, some basic tests, so you can just adjust that. It has a lot of to-do statements, just change this, change this, change this, so that people can really get along with it very easily and hopefully very quickly as well. Uh, another one that we have there is NFCore Lint, which checks for the pipeline conformance with the spec best practices, but I'm not going to show that here. So the slides will be available after the talk. Uh, so you can actually look at that yourself if you're interested in. At the moment, we have like 21 stable pipelines, 15 actively in development at the moment. So stable means there is a release for that pipeline. In development means there must not, or there is probably not the release so far. This is growing quite quickly. So in the end of last year, we had a couple of pipelines finished. So that grow within two or three weeks, we had five, four, five new pipelines actually. Before Christmas, everybody wanted to get their pipeline out apparently. So yeah, that doesn't just happen with journal reviews. Um, the question that a lot of people are now thinking probably is, so what do I get out of this? It sounds nice, it sounds cool, but what do I get? What's in it for me in this case? Yeah. So a small recap towards that is what I've been doing during my PhD. So I did my PhD, as I said, on population genetics, bioinformatics and population genetics. And back then I was supporting a pipeline for ancient DNA analysis. So mummies and stuff like that. So I, I've been starting that as a master's student. I started my PhD doing that. And then I continued supporting the pipeline I started working on when I was a master's student. So that kind of worked in the end. But there were a lot of problems with it. First of all, I had changing use cases. So when I started, there was just a couple of genomes available. And then we had that huge data explosion that I talked about in the very first uh, slides, actually. So the pipeline I wrote wasn't able to do more than single genomes because back then when I started, there were only single genomes. So it was fine for me to do that. But then I had to extend it to accommodate multiple samples, multiple genomes simultaneously, which was cumbersome because my initial idea, my initial concept of the framework wasn't working very well. So, and that happens to a lot of people. You start your PhD, you start your postdoc, you do that for a couple of years. And in the beginning, it all works fine. After a couple of months, you have problems with it because things change. Things change sometimes even dramatically and you should actually be able to accommodate it. Maintenance was one of the biggest issues I had. I had like, in the beginning, we were five people. In the end, when I, when I finished my PhD, there were like 50 people in the group. So supporting 50 people with their analysis questions is a cumbersome, uh, very, let's say, work intensive task. So it's really difficult if you already have to do the bioinformatics work, you have to support people doing bioinformatics with sometimes not a lot of bioinformatics background, and you have to cope with your own pipeline because that doesn't really 100% fulfill what you need to do. And there were other concepts coming up like Conda, containers, schedulers, HPC and cloud systems that I wasn't aware when I started the PhD. So something like this is really something that Nextflow and NF Core can help you with because you don't have to think about these concepts anyway. You don't have to think about support for new HPC systems because that's coming from Nextflow and NF Core. You don't have to invent that yourself. You don't have to implement it yourself. So it's a good idea to use a framework in such concepts and such cases. Another thing that broke almost my neck was legacy code. So I had to use back then a lot of tools and methods that were written in Perl, very outdated methods, sometimes very complex methods that the author wrote like 15 years ago and didn't even know it themselves sometimes what they were actually doing there. And porting that into my own framework was cumbersome. And in the end, it turned out that I had to port that back to Nextflow and NF Core in the end as well. So 
better start early. So if you do something now, today, I would suggest going fully into frameworks like NF Core or NextFlow, because then in the end, you at least use the same framework that a lot of people are using, and then uh, end up having a lot of people that you can ask questions for. So that's the idea behind that. Better not fiddling around with that old legacy code that you have on your system, but rather using some framework like NF Core and going the next flow way, because that makes your life much easier in the long and midterm run. And in the short term, it might seem like it's a bit more effort, but you will see very soon, I have to say, for me, it was like the first two, three weeks were hard. And after that, it always proved to be the better way. The cool thing is also what you do get is, for example, this true reproducibility versus having to deal with lots of dependency issues that you typically see if you do such workflows. I had that with my own workflow. I did that full experience on the right side in my PhD, actually. So I had to set that up, that pipeline back then. I had to set that up on like 10 institutions in the end. I was always cumbersome to do. Today, if you have like a proper nextflow slash nfcore workflow, you just do nextflow run nfcore slash eager, for example, minus r for release 2.0.7, and that will automatically pull everything from GitHub that you need to do this analysis, and you don't have to think about all these dependencies anymore. It saves your life, basically. What you also get is completely automated tests. So you can actually be sure that whatever you're doing in Next for NF Core is tested. If you do it properly, once after these guidelines, then you're safe. There is no such thing as broken workflows in the end. At least in, in general, the most used cases, if you test them properly, are actually covered. So you don't have to figure out what's going on on your system or what's going on on the cluster at some point because you know this is going to work. That's pretty cool. So ideally, it should look like this. What you also get is an entire ecosystem. So around Nextflow, there's been lots of development recently. So it's not just NF Core, but also the Nextflow people were always working together with cloud providers such as Amazon, Google. They were working with few, uh, a couple of other people who are like, for example, making cluster schedulers so you can run your jobs on a cluster system. And they were also making fancy new interfaces. So for example, if you look at this, wait, if you look at this, this is so-called Nextflow Tower. That's actually a nice little web page that you can use when you execute your job on a cluster, for example, on a cloud provider, for example, then what you will be seeing there is basically um, that you can follow the script but you won't see much details about the script that you're running. So, and this is a web log service that you can get access to that's currently in open testing. So you can use that. And then you can basically point your execution job towards that web service and that will collect and fetch some data. So you'll see, for example, how much your wall time was, how many CPU hours something cost, how much memory it consumed, lots of different ideally good insights into your workflow whether it's memory and cpu efficient you can basically trace down what your individual steps were doing and what these were actually executed on for example you see okay that was submitted six, uh, 16th of december it was completed it just took three seconds real time was one second so this kind of stuff is something you get for free you don't have to do that yourself which is also quite nice A couple of do's and don'ts that I always try to get over to people. Um, the most important thing is that you don't fear away from porting stuff to Nextflow and NF Core. Start small, take the most important bits first. That's the easiest way to do it. Ideally, if you have a like small toy workflow that you might want to do some analysis with, that's a good point to start. Just do that. If you feel very familiar with the workflow code that you have there, it's really easy to put that if you already know the code basis very well, then you use the template like the com uh, within the community guidelines ideally, and you just copy over the code that you need to copy over. Take care of the dependencies, put them all in containers, saves your life in the end. 
you will see that that makes things much easier and produce a minimum working example. So just add minimum, uh, some two, three steps maybe, and not just start with the big fancy pipeline that you have in mind with 200 steps. That might be a bit overwhelming in the beginning. And do more, a lot more testing. Start the testing very early. That's also something I found very helpful in the beginning. What's next with NFCore? So at the moment we're working towards more biocontainers integration. Some of you might know that project already. So um, biocontainers is an initiative for community that puts our biological bioinformatics tools into containers and puts them up on Docker Hub or Quay.io. So they can reuse these containers so we don't have to build them ourselves. We're looking to integrate with that project even more. We at the moment are in contact with Amazon to do automated cloud tests for all the NFCore pipelines, even fully real data tested. So at the moment we have some toy data that we typically use to test the, data, uh, the pipelines, for example, like a couple of megabytes, a couple of hundred megabytes maybe in, in size, because we're limited by what GitHub gives you for free for testing purposes. So typically you can't run jobs longer than two, three, four hours, something like that. And uh, using Amazon at some point, uh, we hope that we can actually run like on proper real world full size data sets uh, and test our data uh, pipelines more efficiently. And that will be something that we provide for all pipelines in NF Core. So no matter which kind of uh, pipeline you contribute to. And there's going to be NF Core modules. So at the moment you can create workflows in a way that you stitch tools together, but there will be also meta workflows, sub workflows. So you can stitch workflows together. So if you have, for example, a multi-omics project, you need some proteomics data and you need to analyze some RNA-seq data and uh, get that together at some point, you may use, for example, a proteomics pipeline we have at NF Core. You may use another RNA-seq workflow we have at NF Core and combine them together in a meta way workflow, basically. Okay, for two types of data and combine that together in a single workflow which might be useful for some cases. And what we're trying to do there is producing uh, and providing also modules, so modules for individual processes that people can just reuse in their workflows, which makes it a bit easier to use in the future. Well, and last but not least, um, well, we want you. Um, the community is really open for everyone to join. So it's a completely open source thing. It's very transparent. We have a Slack channel, we have a homepage, we have a very active user community on GitHub. People can join wherever they want. People can join even just looking at code. We don't care. People can contribute if they want to. It's very open, welcoming. And I'm a bit proud to say that it's been attracting a lot of people over the last two years, three years that it's now existing. So you can see that there is quite a bunch of people from very different backgrounds joining in doing their own sorts of things inside the community, inside the framework that we are providing, also contributing to improve certain things in this framework. And we hope that that doesn't stop so that other people also from other fields are joining in because this is not limited to computational genomics work. It's not limited to any kind of computational work. I think people can use that for the concepts behind this can be used for a lot of different types of analyses. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Acknowledgements are some of the people from the NF Core team who also contributed here a lot. Uh, of course, the Nextflow team and the um, other contributors that have been making this possible in the last couple of years. There's a preprint on Bio Archive, and we got good news this year. So the paper has been accepted. So NF Core will be out in the next couple of weeks. I can't disclose because of embargo which journal, but it's going to be out in the next, let's say, three to four weeks in a nice journal. Thank you. And with that, if you have some questions, shoot. Anyone has some questions for Yeah. Yeah, tying back to the community and so on. Um, how is this funded for like long term long term stability? So the idea initially, the, the, the idea behind it was when the project started, everybody had their own grant for something else actually and started doing this off-site basically on, as a site project, let's say. 
uh, we started applying for certain grants at the moment. Some of them went through, some of them didn't. So we have a couple of positions, like half positions here, half position there, that are basically supporting the back end of this development. However, I have to say the core team are normally, so that's like at the moment, I think we're like eight people at the moment in the core team. And team and these are all long-term funded people who are dedicating a certain amount of their workforce towards making this going over the next years. We hope to actually apply for certain future grants to also make that work. So Chan Zuckerberg second round is also something we try to apply for together with the next flow team actually, because that would also allow, allow us to make this a bit more sustainable. It's tricky to get support for this kind of work, unfortunately. Yeah. But. <clears throat> so I definitely want to do something like that flow. But what I've heard before was always airflow and uh, some are in the technical community focusing on Qflow. So um, I mean, why should I use a tool which is coming from bioinformatics instead of a more general tool which is I mean, for me and this machine learning community mm -hmm. applied more like airflow and uh, that maybe can yeah, so flow is not it by me, I have to say that, but we, we just built the community basically. The community that shares the best practices across the community and something like that does not exist for any other community I know for any other workflow system. Maybe for CWL, which is more like a specification level, it's not like the actual implementation, but a specification of workflow uh, language. And to be honest with that, I also looked into other workflow types. Like I actually looked at Airflow. I also looked at Snakemake. We looked at some other um, tools that are out there. In total, there are like 300 now. So that's quite a lot to look through. We didn't look to all three, 300, but I can certainly say like 15. But there was no such community behind any of these except for Nextflow. So Nextflow is the only, let's say, fully fledged so well supported framework that has also these community features with best practices, more active user engagement and a community. That's the biggest thing that we didn't see. However, I have to also say Nextflow itself, it comes from a biological uh, group actually. So it's from CRG in Barcelona, which is a good genomics facility but it's not limited. So there are people in physics using it. So some people at CERN, for example, use Nextflow to do analysis. We have people from chemistry background who do some uh, analysis with it. We have other people from a biological field, evolution of biology, but also other fields. It's not, it's very generalizable. The NF core team has a background in the bioinformatics course, but you can also use the same template for whatever you want, it's generic. We have certain bits in there in the documentation, but you can drop them if you don't need them. And that's not making it difficult to apply it for something completely different out of the field. We even have some people from the industry using it in automotive now. So it's not limited to use this only for bioinformatics related questions. So it's generic if you, that's your point more or less, I guess. Um, I think a lot of end users are quite scared of terminals and command lines in general, and there's a high need for revolution. How well does uh, Nextflow um, integrate tools which have a user revolution interface and do you have a revolution interface yourself or use who just wants to run? So, next command line, whatever you have is called on a command line. Itself, Nextflow does not provide a graphical user interface at the moment. We at NF Core, we do have some ideas how to achieve that at some point, because what we also do with these pipelines, we bundle a JSON object with the pipeline that you produce, you can do that. And that can be used to automatically create a graphical user interface with, let's say, some buttons and a text entry form or something like that. That creates a config file then, and then you just supply that to your pipeline and run the pipeline. That's something we plan to have at some point at the moment. But there is no such thing as a graphical user interface for Nextflow itself at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, one very small question. It's not a question, but it's a rather a common because um, I guess a general problem of all 
uh, workflow system for matter of next to those making or whatever. If you have the tool uh, that uh, an expensive license that we have, so we will get yet another more expensive license before we put it on the center for the suitability. Uh, and it is a thing that we ask when uh, some people, uh, some of them, their best tools, and uh, you have to pay for them. So I guess there is no perfect uh, solution uh, just but uh, can't be demand that hey, demand that hey. Um, for the sake of purpose, please uh, offer some versions of tools which are not that expensive. Yeah. In the prediction pipeline that we used, and we, in the end, we figured out okay, there's some updated tools out there in open source that can be used as a, uh, as a replacement for that method. And in the end, decided to drop all of the proprietary software inside because we said, okay, prediction is even better with the open source tool now. Why should we keep this fancy method, even if it's just 500, 600 euros for the license, which is not too much given some standards? But uh, in the end, we said it's cumbersome. We can't distribute the pipeline. We can't make it accessible to other people from other institutions. It breaks the entire concept behind this community. So, and the reproducibility. Yeah, I like that as well. The better way. Okay, let's thank Alexander again for a nice talk.